Hey everyone, Brian Beeler here. Welcome to the podcast. We've got a, uh, a great conversation coming up around data protection and some of the latest and greatest things that are going on there. David Noy makes a return visit to the podcast from Dell Technologies. David, how are you today? I am doing pretty well. Thanks, Brian. All right. So I, I set it up with data protection, but I assure you, I promise you, I will not be giving you 35 minutes of ransomware stuff because while that's an important topic, I find that excruciatingly boring uh, to the point of, of uh, discussing it that long. But we'll probably glance along uh, that subject uh, a little bit. But David, just at a high level for, for those that may not know the portfolio, what is in the Dell Tech uh, data protection portfolio these days? What does that look like? It ranges across a number of products, Brian. There's, um, you know, we have a deep heritage in software and hardware for data protection. So we have the Avamore Networker products, very widely adopted, very widely used. They provide a very deep breadth of functionality. Um, and you'll see them everywhere, from the smallest customers to the largest Fortune 100s. And then, of course, we have our Power Protect DD, which is you know the world's leading uh, backup target, uh, with just you know rock solid resilience, unbelievable reduction rates. And then you'll see that underneath our own software, but you also see that underneath a lot of other third-party backup vendors. So it's kind of the vendor-neutral. Um, storage target that gives you the best TCO for your <clears throat> for your backup and data protection uh, deployments. Now, having said that, there's a number of derivative softwares that we've built, things like DPA for reporting. There's capabilities like cloud snapshot management. Um, we sell an as-a-service offering called Apex Backup Service. Um, we're doing kind of, uh, you know, hybrid or in-cloud PaaS backups. Um, and then recently we've introduced, a couple of years ago, we introduced something called PPDM, Power Protect Data Manager. It's okay. kind of a next generation uh, backup software, data protection software, really, you know, re-architected and, and uh, to be more containers based, um, to be more modern in terms of the underlying constructs. And that's going to be kind of our big bet going forward. Doesn't mean that we stop investing in Avamar Networker. Those are so deep in terms of breadth and functionality, but there's a coexistence strategy. And I'll talk about that as we go through the, the, the discussion. And, you know, as a while back, we took um, PowerProtect DD, we virtualized it. <clears throat> and then that gives you a software defined version of our uh, backup target, PowerProtect DD. It's available in cloud, it's available on prem. Yeah, that guy shows up in cloud and also in uh, like VxRail. I know it's in the little store to, to kind of plug in and add yeah. data protection to, to your, uh, your Rail vSAN uh, setup there. Yeah, people use it <clears throat> on-prem in, in, in Rail, but in cloud. Actually, what, what people don't know is we protect about 17 logical exabytes of data with the PowerProtect uh, DD Virtual Edition in cloud today. In cloud, 17 exabytes. It's a lot. And it's not something that we commonly talk about. You don't usually think, oh, wow, these guys are really just crushing it in cloud. It's a lot of data. Um, well, that's, I mean, that's, uh, uh, well, not to interrupt you, but that's obviously a huge number, but you're right. Like the, the virtual edition uh, was kind of put out there to bridge some of these gaps with things like hyper-converged. And then I, I know when you launched it in the cloud, it was, sort of a, a software defined first way to approach data protection in the cloud. The fact that that, that, little, that little engine that could, that probably when you, in your wildest dreams, I don't think you guys probably mapped out that much uh, data protected under DDVE in, in the early days. I mean, you couldn't have imagined it would grow that fast. Oh, I don't think, no, I, it, you, no way. And even, <laughs> you know, I reached Dell a couple of years ago and I was looking at how fast it was growing. It's only accelerating. Huh. You know, um, so we're just seeing more and more of it. And, you know, the value proposition is pretty straightforward. You're backing up stuff in cloud. Cloud infrastructure is not cheap. If I can give you 10 to 1, 50 to 1 reduction on your backups in cloud, you know, I'm dramatically reducing your infrastructure cost to actually store images and, and keep them for a sure. period of time. In cloud. So it's, it's, a, it's an arbitrage mechanism against cloud costs. Mm -hmm. So customers love it. Um, 
we've actually built some innovation on top of it. Uh, it's not available in cloud yet, but you know, obviously we're qualifying the cloud vendors called Smart Scale. Smart Scale is the ability to federate uh, multiple PowerProtect DDs or DDVEs, 32 of them together into one giant namespace. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like the beginnings of the ability to scale. And then um, for customers, you know, who want to buy a full integrated appliance, we had we have a product called IDPA. We continue to sell IDPA, the integrated data protection appliance. But we've introduced a new product, uh, again, taking that PowerProtect data manager, the next generation backup application, with that DDVE, that little engine that could, mm -hmm. and wrapped it together into one fully integrated appliance. And I got to tell you, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, so the IDPA appliance, I actually remember that well. We looked at it uh, in the very early days, and I know what you were trying to do back then was take some of these services that you mentioned, six or seven, and aggregate them into one unit uh, with licensing that was a little more easy to understand rather than six or, or you know, whatever the, the count was. And uh, that was a really good step forward. It wasn't as far as definitely where you are now, and we'll get into that because back in the day, the IDPA appliance still had multiple logins and it wasn't, it was clearly on the road to your vision for a unified, easy to manage appliance, but, but was uh, only a step in that direction, I would say. Um, right. But I still understand it was successful for you and, and, did a, and, and got customers you know, moving in the direction uh, you wanted them to or wanted to enable them to, right? Well, and it continues to be successful. So we're still, you know, doing well with that product. Um, but to your point, you know, it's one thing to take a couple of different products and kind of, you know, make that experience a little bit easier to deploy and use. It's another thing to build a fully integrated solution where you're really only interacting with an operating environment. The fact that there's components running underneath that we're reusing our technology is should be completely seamless and invisible. And that ranges from everything from <clears throat> how you upgrade the system to how you secure the system to how you, you know, provide disaster recovery and uptime for that system or maintenance. Um, it should be just one seamless product as a single offering. And you know, that construct is something that we're going to continue to evolve. So we, we just put it out this year, but it, it's definitely on an evolutionary path with a, a North Star in sight. Right, and so you've got some new appliances there, and I wanna talk through, th through that as well, but you, you made me think of something while we're talking about um, making things easy, right? Making the operations of, of any of these pieces of equipment or software packages easy. I mean, that seems to be one of the driving factors that we hear, not just uh, from you on, on, on data protection and backup, I think it's across the board, right? Whether it's adding Bluefield DPUs to, to VxRail, making sure that I can update them through iDRAC and through the common tools that, uh, that people are used to for, for lifecycle controller management. I mean, just some of the, the little stuff and, you know, little, I mean, it's still very important and I know it's, it's not simple engineering, but taking all of these functions and trying to put them in a spot or, or two spots max where people can go and manage and interact with these things uh, so that their their IT departments are not having to spend a lot of time looking for places to do things that they can just go in and administer things easily or their partner because I know a lot of these things are deployed through the channel and, and sometimes a partner manages it for you so keeping it simple so that you're not uh, logging a bunch of partner time to to do you know a lot of these these day to day tasks. I mean, all this stuff is really important. Now, I'm sure you're getting that feedback from your customers. Yeah. So actually, the the channel partners who've tried it, and we have you know, I won't tell you how many, but there's um, there's lots of seed units out there that have gone out to channel partners, and the the feedback that comes back consistently is, wow, this thing was just a breeze. So you know, our litmus test is pretty simple. Um, you find anyone in the organization who's got a vice president title or higher, because at that point, operating a conference call, let alone, you know, uh, data protection appliance is hard enough, right? Um, and uh, we put them, you know, set them loose on the appliance. So from unboxing to getting it up to first backup, <clears throat> consistently getting about 15 minutes um, to get that thing up and going, which is phenomenal. And when we compare, you know, the time it takes to actually 
perform operations like virtual machine backups to the time it takes to actually configure and get things set up. The combination of performance and the combination of simplicity that makes it easy to get it operating and easy and fast to even to operate in your you know in your day to day experience. Um, we compare that to some of our competitors, and you know we're anything from thirty to forty percent faster than pretty much anyone out there. Um, and again, if if someone like me or you know an SVP of engineering who hasn't coded in decades can sit down and get that thing up and running in fifteen minutes across the board without a glitch. Um, I think that's the hallmark of success. Well, I will say that I went out to, uh, to Hopkinton, to your labs, and got hands-on with, uh, with the new PowerProtect uh, appliances. I hadn't yet uh, interacted with them at all. And we, we started with one at zero. So it was powered on and had an IP address. And then we went to a conference room and connected over a laptop. And, and uh, we recorded that session. We'll, 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 uh, we'll publish uh, that video at some point. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a lot of basic blocking and tackling at the beginning. It's some of the administrative info. It's setting up a, you know, a backup a security account, which I actually like some of these uh, two keys to do anything you know, real serious on, on the system. And, and plugging in to an existing VMware environment. I mean, it's, it's insanely simple to the point where, and, and I hope you take this as a compliment, is that it felt like I wasn't administering an appliance and a backup application. It was just right. a thing. It was one thing that 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 did that. And I, I I know you probably like that, but I also don't want to diminish the the uh, the power of any one of those pieces. But it 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 was pretty fluid. Well, there's a, there's a lot that goes into orchestrating all of that. So imagine that we have different development teams, ones who are working on the backup application because it can run as a standalone backup application. We sell quite a bit of it that way. There's the the data protect, the, the I guess the target appliance that's running in there virtualized, as you just mentioned, 17 exabytes of that running separately. There's a whole team that's, how do I put these things together in a way that obfuscates the fact that these are different products but makes it very clean interface by which you work with the product and then aligning all of the release schedules so that the features come out on the same cadence like there's a lot of orchestration that goes into getting that to work, uh, you know, clockwork, turnkey. And it's just, it's coming off without a hitch. I, I love it. Yeah, and the, uh, the hardware's pretty cool. I mean, I, I like the dual shelf design for your dense systems, but you've got some flash in there too, uh, which, which is good. I mean, it's uh, for some of the rapid restores and uh, it is good to have on board. Tell, walk through some of the, the hardware highlights or some of the things that, that you like uh, the most from the hardware side. I mean, for our, our, uh, our, our tech nerds, you know, as much as the appliance is a thing and you're buying the appliance, like the, some of the underlying bits, I think, are pretty cool there. Well, it is on a PowerEdge server, right? So you have that and you mm -hmm. will continue to evolve that as the new PowerEdge lines come out. I think the other cool thing is that we ship it fully populated um, you know, up to 96 terabytes out of the gate. So, you know, we'll, ex we'll be adding an expansion shelf to that, to 256 terabytes shortly. Um, but the idea is that, you know, for smaller customers, so for channel, we're going after more of the commercial mid-market who want to start small and grow large. The expansion is just a license key-based expansion. And again, this is in the spirit of simplicity, right? We don't have mm -hmm. to ship any more capacity to you. And so we want to continue to keep things as simple as possible, whether it's expansions or what have you. Um, you know, because you have this operating environment that's wrapped around the, the sub the sub products that are built in, we can really lock down that box as well. So one of the big things you hear about all the time, and you know, without even going into the cybersecurity, is just security in general. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of our customers who are looking at penetration testing, and hey, you know, can I go in and spoof retention lock by modifying the clock on the system and basically pushing it forward 10 years and all of a sudden all the locks expired. Now I can go delete everything or modify any file. So we just locked the whole thing down. It's com you know um, completely controlled environment, which is great. Um, that gives you a level of security that you wouldn't have otherwise had. 
Well, that, I mean, that's fair because in every report that, that any you know, infrastructure or backup app or anyone puts out, it's about the, the vectors for cyber attacks and they are very much on the backups because that's your, your last line. Uh, it's your primary defense, but it's also your last line of defense, right? Because if they, if they nuke your backups and then go after your production, you've got, you've got no you know, leg to stand on when it comes to remediating that. Yep. So, so again, it's uh, exactly, we, we try to lock it down. It is integrated with our entire cyber stack. So we'll be able to use this to go into a cyber vault. But, mm -hmm. you know, the form factor, very slim, nice little 2U box. Um, and again, the ability to go add expansions down the road makes it easier to go grow, expand in the box itself. Um, the performance we're getting out of it is, is great. So the restore and um, backup performance is just fantastic. <clears throat> part of it is because of the hardware specs. Part of it is also because of some of the technologies that we use, particularly around VMware. So we have the ability within our, you know, the, the backup application that's built in, PPDM, Power Protected Data Manager, has a, a feature called Transparent Snapshots, which basically is a very lightweight mechanism for taking uh, backups of VMware. Um, that really doesn't cause any impact to the VMware cluster it's backing up. But as, a, as kind of a side effect of that, um, those lightweight snapshots are just a lot faster to move across the wire. So the whole restore and backup speeds are just sped up and accelerated uh, dramatically. So overall, I think just, just a solid product. And again, just gonna continue to get better. It's just in its first iterations. So you talked about it. Um... The, the high-end build at 96 terabytes, I know you've got a smaller one too. So in terms of the audience that you're after with this, is this <clears throat> primarily mid-market down? I mean, how are you thinking about this? And, and where's the line that you're seeing with customers between consuming an integrated appliance like this and then doing something like you know, a, a, a data domain or a, a Avamar and data domain, whatever, a, a larger infrastructure off to the side, like kind of where, where are those swim lanes kind of? Uh, yeah, so out? we, um, <clears throat> you know, they're not always around just capacity. So if you think about data domain, it could be customers already picked their third party software vendor and they want a best of breed target underneath. That's where we're okay. going to see success. And data domain scales to just over a petabyte. So pretty good amount of capacity in one package. <clears throat> um, the initial offering of this integrated appliance, we call it. DM5500 is a 96 terabyte box, but again, starting at 12 terabyte, internally provisioned, mm -hmm. easily extensible via software licensing to 96. <clears throat> and then later on this year, we'll add a 256 terabyte expansion shelf. So it'll grow to 256 with the expansion shelf. Now, over time, you can imagine this is part of a broader strategy to get much bigger than that. <clears throat> so the sure. frameworks that I talked about that orchestrate bringing together the backup software and that backup target as a software extension are all being built to be containerized, fully modern architectures. And you can kind of imagine where this might go um, as a software defined offering underneath the covers, it's just running on PowerEdge. So it is fully a software defined offering. This doesn't have to necessarily run on our tin. It could run in the cloud. Um, and because there are, you know, it's been containerized and internally, the software has been containerized. You can start to imagine that this might become uh, a multi-node system down the road. So this has sure. all evolved very quickly into, into something that I think is gonna be pretty exciting uh, for the industry. Um, for customers right now that we're targeting with the DM5500, specifically it's focused on the kind of mid-market mm -hmm. enterprise up to around the mid-size enterprise because that's where that 256 terabyte would play. Um, larger enterprise might be looking for uh, something larger and that's where we've got plans to go and expand this in the years after this year. From a growth perspective though, it sounds like you're enthusiastic about where you're starting with the DM5500, but where you're going with it to be able to hit more market segments, to hit a, a bigger slice of that overall market with an appliance that's super easy to consume. To be fair, the back and recovery is not always super simple. I mean, I think that's right next to networking where, where somebody's always complaining 
about something not being set up right or configured right or or whatever like those two trade off with uh, with internal IT admin complaints more than anything else I hear. Yeah, and, and you know the other thing is that if you look at our protect DD <clears throat> ranging to a petabyte, you know we don't get that many requests for customers like, hey, go build me a twenty petabyte backup something, right? Because mm -hmm. with backup being your last line of defense, you don't necessarily want to put all your eggs in one basket like that. So what you'll tend to see is more more deployments of in that 200 to kind of 800 terabyte range, maybe all the way to a petabyte in a larger enterprise. Even in a large enterprise or a Fortune 100, <clears throat> it's very rare that someone would ask you for, oh, go build me a five petabyte backup target. They'll say, build me five one petabyte backup targets, make them easy to manage. Yeah. Um, that way, if, I, if, I, if one goes down for whatever reason, you know, something catches on fire, um, then I have, <clears throat> I've reduced my blast radius significantly by not putting all the eggs in one basket. So you can do some of that with the cloud too, right? With the 5500, because there is cloud connectivity. Why don't you walk through some of that in terms of the cloud's relevance in the data protection world for this mid-market uh, target? Yep. So um, <clears throat> in the next release of the software that goes on the product, I will be able to either tier to cloud uh, we'll also be able to replicate to a DDBE that's running in cloud. So that can be your DR copy, for example. And then um, if you want to have that then go off to a vault for cyber protection, that can be the source to a vault. So uh, that on-prem DM5500 can drive cloud consumption, can tier, can replicate, and then use the cloud as its essential, uh, as its vault destination as well. Uh, all of those things will be capable. It'll be capable of doing. At some point, we'll actually lift the entire operating environment off and drop it in the cloud, so you can have a mirror image of that um, appliance running in cloud as well as on prem. Is there an analog for that um, in more of an enterprise hub and spoke? I'm thinking retail. I mean, that's been a hot topic lately, with yeah. so much uh, like AI inferencing and stuff being driven out to retail. They're creating more data. There's all this customer intent data in store. I mean, there's so much going on there and that, that orgs want to preserve that, uh, but maybe they don't want to ship it to, to a public cloud. Maybe they want to drive it to an internal cloud and, and back up the same sort of way. If I'm going to create all this POS data and, and time clock and all this and back it up on-prem, but I want to send it back to the core data center, is there a way to make that happen with, a, with an internal yeah. cloud? Okay. So you got to remember that all these components that are running inside of this integrated solution, even though it's presented as an integrated solution out to the customer, they're all components that we use. So for example, the, the target, the storage target management is actually just that PowerProtect DD software. So mm -hmm. I could run this little, I could put this little box into all of my uh, retail locations, um, you know, in the closet room, wherever it is, and, you know, be backing up onto it. And then replicating that back to a large, you know, big iron power protect DD that's running in a data center somewhere. And that could be basically where all the data is being sent for, you know, for basically for the long term or for, um, uh, you know, for different retention policy or for uh, even the, the genesis of a vault that's being kept actually on prem as opposed to in the cloud. So, or for disaster recovery purposes. So I just in case that little, closet things goes down, there's another copy back in the data center. But the data center could be my um, hub and all of these retail locations could be the spokes. And this thing is so small that it's actually viable for that kind of a use case. Well, we see plenty of half racks in those types of use cases where it's two or three servers, a switch, maybe a, a UPS or something. You know, another 2U for, for backup is not, not a very big lift. Uh, you know, figuratively or <laughs> or in uh, in the reality of, of racking this thing. So that's easy, you know, from a space standpoint or relatively easy. Um, you talked a lot about uh, VMware integration and backing up. One of the things that I thought was interesting, as you go through the setup configuration process, or I guess after you're done and now we want to set up a backup job, You've, you've designed it to be very wizard-like where, you know, it's pick VMware and then add the credentials and select the VMs and, and go start your jobs. 
But it's not only VMware. There's uh, all sorts of application options, and then there's uh, you know more modern things like Kubernetes is there too. Um, talk to me a little bit about Kubernetes and that integration, and, and why that's important to you. I mean, I think you picked up on it, which is uh, again inside that integrated appliance is our next generation data protection product, our Protect Data Manager. It has a rich set of functionality around not just VMware, Oracle, SQL. Um, there's Exchange backup capabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, Kubernetes in there. And so obviously all of our modern workloads that we're going to go back up are going to be handled by uh, this PowerProtect Data Manager, including NAS backup as well. Now there's a modern one, but we try to handle it in a much more um, high throughput way. So at some point being able to handle multi-petabyte uh, NAS data sources. Um, so really the, gen the, the focus of all of our innovation around modern workload um, support is going to be adding it into PowerProtect Data Manager as it comes into that product, which is again available as a standalone product and people use it that way. Uh, but then because the releases are all orchestrated the way we talked about earlier, every release of the product that adds new workload support, that integrated appliance by default then picks those up as well. So we'll be looking to add more support around Hadoop, for example, then it'll go in when it goes into Power Protect Data Manager, we'll pick up Hadoop. Um, when we add support for any like uh, the next generation databases, mm -hmm. um, it gets picked up and we'll basically go into this integrated appliance. So there's a lot of benefits of having that embedding of our you know flagship next generation data protection software. So do you have to have native support to be able to back something up? I'm just thinking about a customer that has something that you don't have a a wizard for or an integration for specifically, what what do we do there? Um, you know, in general, though, we'll be building out the operating environment in conjunction with the actual uh, backup software. So we'll, again, because those are orchestrated to come out in lockstep, mm -hmm. the support comes out in both simultaneously at the same time. So we'll, you'll never kind of be in a case where we added something into one and it's not in the other. Okay. Um, there are some generic pre and post script capabilities for, you know, just kind of manually uh, scripting certain types of backups. And those are always there and available to you. Uh, but in general, we want to make sure that this experience is not going to be a hacky one where it's like, I'm going into the backup software and trying to work around the fact that this doesn't exist in the overarching uh, packaged solution. We want to make sure that that's a smooth transition. Okay, well, that makes sense. So you're, you're talking a lot about the on-prem workloads. Have you paid um, you know, much mind share to any of the as-a-service workloads? Because that's another big push in the, in the backup space. And I guess part of the reason why the organizations, large organizations average, what is it, like five backup applications in their environment? It's some kind of ridiculous number. But a lot of it now is driven by SaaS apps like O365 or uh, any of anything, any of the uh, SAP workloads that, that are running in clouds. I mean, those workloads are fundamentally not protected by that service provider in almost every case. So right. are, the, are those targets for something like this too, or is that too far outside of the scope of, of what you're doing with the, the DM5500? Not just yet. So we have... Um... We can have two different ways of backing up in cloud infrastructure, um, or maybe three, I should say. Let's try to enumerate them. So one is that the PowerProtect data manager that runs inside this integrated appliance also is available in the cloud. So you can deploy it in AWS. Um, simple cloud formation template, you get PowerProtect data manager and a DDB instance. And so for doing application integration, it works fine. That's application running on cloud compute. Okay. For actually backing up cloud infra like compute instances using snapshots. Um, we have something called Cloud Snapshot Manager. It's not fully integrated into PowerProtect Data Manager yet, but it is a SaaS solution for doing snapshot-based um, backups. So basically it takes snapshots and it sends them off to storage for you know, deduplication and retention. Um, and then we also have, for some of the SaaS apps that you mentioned, like M365 and so on, the ABS, the Apex Backup Service offering. And so 
those are not integrated into Power Protect Data Manager yet, but you know you can see where our goal is to get everything into that Power Protect Data Manager console so that it's mm -hmm. an all-in-one UI. And it was as a user, if I want to take a snapshot-based approach to backing up, say, EC2 instances running in Amazon, and I want to have uh, backups of my M365 and my SQL PaaS or whatever or what have you, and I want to also back up my enterprise applications like Oracle and um, and some NAS workloads. I want all of that to be in one pane of glass. Today, it's still a little bit segregated. Um, there are some link and launch capabilities, but that's all coming together. And that Power Protect Data Manager is should be the one UI to kind of rule them all. And that'll be also embedded into any of these integrated appliances. So we're on the journey to go do that. Um, yeah. Can give well, you the it, exact it makes it makes a lot of sense because it well unifying it all in one spot makes a tremendous amount of sense. What are organizations going to have to do to adjust to this more modern world of of disparate apps on prem in the cloud as a service, whatever? Because it it seems to me, and you you probably know this better than I do, that a lot of organizations are buying these subscription services without having any notion of of data at all for forgetting about the uh, the fact of um, you know having a, a backup and recovery process in place and the clouds have made it so easy to buy and consume these things which is great uh, but I do worry a lot that that we're one mistake or one outage away or, or one bad event from a lot of a lot of maybe smaller orgs getting burned because they they didn't understand the implications of uh, of what the SLAs are from any of these providers. And, and I don't know, I'm just curious if you're, what you're seeing. Yeah, I mean, um, and it happens, right? It, it does happen. So, you know, one is to adopt a multi-cloud strategy, right? And that means that, you know, where you can, uh, customers have to be looking at what services are available in both clouds. In cases where you're kind of beholden to one, if I'm using M365, there's no analog in any other uh, cloud vendor, then I want to make sure that um, not only do I have a data protection strategy that's augmenting any of the simple uh, data protection that's built into the offering itself, the service by the cloud vendor, but then I've also thought through like, hey, do I have this protected in multiple availability zones or multiple regions? So if an entire region goes down, that I can restore my operations and actually bring them back online in another region. Um, having, having planned that out and mapped it out and gone through and kind of built a run book for if something bad were to happen, how do I get things back up and running uh, is, a, is really important. And to that extent, <clears throat> you know, we're about to release a pretty sophisticated orchestrated recovery capability. Hmm. This orchestrated recovery capability says, look, if you look at the different <clears throat> services and, and applications that you have in your environment that you're protecting, how do you ensure that they kind of come back in the right order, that the most critical ones come back first and that the dependencies are basically restored um, appropriately so that you can get specific applications back up and online as soon as possible? If, for example, this group of resources have to come back together, let's make sure they come back together. If they're the most critical ones, let's make sure that they come back together first. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a pretty um, important kind of planning process to go through and then we encourage customers to go and test their recovery processes. Make sure that, hey, guess what? Like, let's run a fire drill. Let's make sure that in the case that I actually do have to come back, I can come back. And that includes everything from fire drilling a, a normal recovery operation to, you know, uh, oops, there was a catastrophic data loss because of a region going down in the cloud or a data center going down to a malicious data loss because somebody's gone and actually um, infiltrated a system. All of these things are things that you really should take the time to, you know, um, you know a little bit of that when we learned, we learned uh, back in, when, when I was younger, stop, drop, and roll, right? Because I grew up in, uh, in California. <laughs> or in Star we, well, I Star had that one too, yeah. Yeah, I was like, uh, you know, um, 
if there's an earthquake, like where do you where do you go? What do you do? Like make sure you just practice it until every until you're really good at it. And I think that uh, you know our customers really have to do that too. So just plan it out, no, build your books. I agree. Yeah, it. make a plan and then execute it right and 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 test it. I will add to that stop, drop, and roll though. In, in Ohio, we don't have very many earthquakes. Every now and then we have one, but our answer to everything was hide under your desk at school. <laughs> so yeah, not exactly. if you're not if you're on fire, but earthquake. Uh, the Russians, you know, nuke us, which was a thing we were scared about in the eighties. I mean, whatever else it was, it was always hide under your desk. <laughs> exactly. Yep. <laughs> With moderate success. Um, no, that's uh, that that makes sense, and and I do think we need to do a lot more of of getting these these playbooks ready and then testing. I mean a lot of a lot of organizations will create the book, never update the book, never test the book, in which case, you know, why even create it in the first place? You're just going to you're you're going to run into a problem uh, along the way, but uh, uh, going through those processes is, is a is an important thing. Um, the other thing that you guys did recently, and I, I know this was um, part of a, a recent blog, I believe, and I haven't had a chance to, to play with it yet, but you're doing some power protect integrations with other parts of the Dell portfolio as well. So it's yeah. not just it's not just backup and recovery, not just cloud, not just services. You've got some new power store stuff too, don't you? Yeah. So you know, if you think about you know, we want to make sure that the product that we're building has a lot of great differentiation. And so you brought up. Um, the stuff that we've done with VMware, some of the next generation workloads, um, the stuff that we're doing around orchestrated recovery, but the, the, you bring up a really good point, which is that one of the things that we have as an advantage with Dell is that we do have a very broad footprint of Dell storage in the data center. Mm -hmm. And for customers who are backing up stuff from PowerStore or from PowerMax, who want sort of a, a direct um, from storage to backup uh, path, um, that they can basically set up, okay, I'm going to back up these um, these storage targets directly into my DDB or my deep PowerPlug DDB environment. Uh, we're building that storage direct capability into PowerStore. We had it in PowerMax. We're kind of rebuilding it to make it easier to use. Mm -hmm. But that gives you a very uh, high performance um, direct path from storage into the backup target. Um, just easy to configure, easy to use, and, and extremely beneficial for mission critical workloads where you need that performance, uh, you need that direct connectivity. Well, I mean, it continues to, I mean, you guys have been telling the better together story forever since you really had uh, you know, the server business, then networking and, and storage all coming together. I mean, it's been, it's been a big part of the, uh, the Dell Tech trumpet, but um, seeing these little, you know, I call them little, it's probably a, a bigger deal than that, but seeing these little integrations across the portfolio does really hammer that point home that there that there's reason for, uh, you know, working you know, with across the portfolio and there's benefits you know, to do that. Absolutely. And it doesn't just stop at the block product. So even with PowerScale, we have that um, high speed NAS backup as well. So, you know, as I say, when we go in, we're able to go in position Hey, for all of your storage needs, you have best of read file, we have best of read block, and oh, by the way, if you want to back it up, we have tight integration. And so, to your point, it is a very, very much a better together story. Well, and I suppose too is that as you continue to disassociate software and hardware, I mean, obviously you need both to run, but you know, that's that's the uh, Alpine project, right? To to pull. Some of these uh, the the storage softwares you know apart from the purpose built hardware so that they can run in the cloud or run on on more power edgy kind of infrastructure conceivably, um, but having those connections between the applications the underlying OSs and applications is is uh, is really going to add I think more value potentially as as you go further down that path. Absolutely. So it, you you know your choice of deployment your choice of you know, where you want to home things, your choice of consumption model. So we're obviously we're getting with, with Alpine and sort of moving things to more software defined. Consumption models become more flexible as well. And then, um, and, and, and uh, your licensing models, or is I going to pay for uh, as I go? Am I going to, you know, which is more like a cloud-like model? And then how does all of that then tie together? And how do we orchestrate um, 
data mobility between these products as well, right? So both backup and the restore or replication between products that exist on-prem and potentially in the cloud. And you start to get some very interesting topologies between people running things on-prem and in different clouds and then moving data between on-prem and the cloud or into colo locations where they can get potentially reduced or zero egress fees and then serve multiple clouds from one set of infrastructure. All of these things become possible and so then it becomes up to the customer to go and say, okay, well, let's work with Dell as a trusted partner to figure out based on the problem we're trying to solve, where is the best place to put our infrastructure so it meets our needs and uh, gives us the best TCO, gives us the best performance and reliability. Yeah, yeah. Well, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, uh, as I've said throughout this conversation, we played with uh, the deployment, the VMware integration, a couple other points along the way and it's all very simple and that's one thing the backup and recovery in my view is is really suffered from over the years is that it was it was always thought of that that it had to be robust and reliable and and so many nines of availability and because you can't you just can't lose data there and that's a that's a great underlying tenant but usability i think somewhere along the way and and ease of management kind of didn't fall to the wayside but wasn't the priority uh, but clearly with the DM5500, you, you guys have made tremendous strides there. And, and it's pretty clear to see where you're going with it too, which is, is kind of neat because you, with many products, you can't often telegraph too much uh, because it's, uh, you know, all, for all sorts of reasons. But the, uh, the direction you're headed down here makes a lot of sense to me. I think um, it, was, it was hard from a marketing perspective. Like you always want to hone in on three words to describe your product, right? <laughs> And, you know, but if I, if I want to just throw away the three word rule for a minute, like really what we're trying to aim for is simple, secure, modern, resilient, right? And then as you can see, we're adding a scale factor that's coming in with the expansion shelves and then where this could potentially go because it's containerized. Um, and of course, um, making it multi-cloud or hybrid cloud, whatever you want to call it, that um, is kind of another even dimension that we could build in or will be building in to that integrated appliance experience. And so it's hard to pick which of those three you want to hone in on, but um, the first four are certainly the key tenets, right? That's simple and secure along with a modern resilient architecture. And the resilience is really important because when we're shipping a new product like this, we want people to understand that this is not like, hey, we just built a yesterday type technology that, the, for example, the Data Domain Virtual Edition or uh, DDBE mm -hmm. that ships inside that product, that is tried, true, and tested technology. Um, very resilient, super efficient, and uh, but made better with that wrapper around it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, there, there are a lot of tools, but at the same time, part of the the allure for the 5500 is that the customer doesn't really need to know that. If they want to know that and, and you want to have that conversation with a senior technology official at an organization or even the practitioners, that's great. But like you said at the the onset, the the, the person, a, a, a VP or, or, uh, or up that you want to have hands-on experience this, they'll never know and never have to know what, what's that's behind it, right? I mean, that's part of the, the beauty of it. Outwardly simple, inwardly rich and complex. Like it's, it's got to have the, the depth on the inside to make give you the assurances that this is a tried and tested technology, but the presentation tier has got to be elegant and simple. I feel like you're describing somebody at a dinner party I just met about two weeks ago, but uh, <laughs> that's, that's funny. All right, so uh, we've played with this thing a little bit. Uh, we've got content out. Uh, we'll, we'll link to it uh, in, in the description here. We'll link to the product page so that people can check that out. How else can, can someone interact with one of these appliances? What's the best way to, to check it out to get hands-on? Uh, we have hands-on labs, I believe. Um, gosh, I, I was just looking at the URL the other day. Um, All right, we'll, yeah, there are we'll, labs. we'll fire that in too. Yeah, and then... Uh, you know, reach out to your channel partner, reach out to your Dell sales reps, and we'll figure out how we can get you a demo. Um, those demo systems are available, and there's uh, seed units all over the world of different channel partners where they're actually floored, and you can actually go and, and get hands-on. 
All right. Yeah. I mean, it's like you said, it, it's, it's very simple. Um, in modern, it's got the containers that, that we talked about, support for Kubernetes and, and all sorts of other applications. And I know your, your, uh, your software rollout cadence is, is relatively quick here too. So as, as you guys are developing new technology in the overall platform, it's getting pushed out here too relatively quickly. So that's all, all good to see. So I think this will be a dynamic platform and something to watch to continue uh, to see what you guys do with it. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to that, uh, that growth as well. Thanks. Yep. I'm very excited. <laughs> good. Well, thanks for doing the pod again, David. Uh, appreciate the repeat of performance. It must not have been too painful last time if you came back. And uh, I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll talk again soon. We got Dell Tech World right around the corner. Always happy to chat with you. All right. Thank you.